It is September 21st, 2017. We're here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, this is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with Skin Edge, uh, principal, Georgia Link um, consulting firm. Um, we're here for the Georgia, the two-party two Georgia uh, oral history program at the University of Georgia, sponsored by the Russell Library. Thank you for being with us, My Mr. Pleasure, Ed. Ashton. Really do appreciate you. it. Absolutely. Um, just to begin with, um, can you give us a little bit about your background, you know, where you grew up, how sure. you grew up? Sure, be glad to. Uh, I was actually born in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, my dad was stationed in the Navy then near there, and uh, so I, uh, uh, I came along and was born in Richmond. My family lived there for about nine months, but as soon as he was discharged from the Navy, uh, we returned to Georgia where uh, my family's been from uh, mm -hmm. for many, many years. So we returned to LaGrange, Georgia, where my dad was from and his, his father was from. Uh, grew up in LaGrange, uh, uh, had two brothers. Uh, we we uh, attended the public schools there in LaGrange, graduated from LaGrange High School in 1973. Uh, but it was a great, great town to grow up in, a good small town, uh, mm -hmm. knew everybody and, uh, and had a lot of family uh, relatives there and, and many, many friends, and uh, my dad still resides there to this day. Oh, so you're, you're, you're a West Georgia uh, guy, born, well, not born and bred, but bred yep. uh, and raised. Um, went to the University of Georgia. I did. A double dog. Double dog, which, which was uh, kind of interesting. My, my dad had gone to Georgia Tech. Uh, he actually played football at Georgia Tech. My grandfather had gone to Tech. My uncle had gone to Tech. But I knew early on uh, I did not want to be an engineer. Calculus was not my strong suit. Uh, you and everybody else. Well, I was, but I always knew from a young age uh, I was interested in two things, law and politics, and I wanted to pursue those. And uh, in trying to decide where to go to school, uh, my dad said, if, you, uh, if you're interested in, in uh, practicing law in Georgia and also getting into politics in Georgia, you need to go to the University of Georgia. And, uh, I did, and it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I, I was in Athens seven years, uh, four years undergraduate, then went straight into law school for three years and loved every minute of it. And uh, people say, uh, did you get tired of being in Athens for seven years? I say, no, I, I enjoyed it <laughs> a lot. So uh, it, it was a great place to be, uh, uh, great school, and uh, was fortunate to, to, to do both undergraduate and law school there. Great, great. So, did you grow up in a political family? These were engineers. Um, that's yeah, not... not really. All my family was in the textile business. Okay. Uh, uh, all all my, my, my dad and my grandfather, my relatives, most of them were in the textile business and weren't real political. Um, uh, to say my, now, my mother's father, uh, who was from Coweta County, where I live now, uh, Lamar Potts, he was the sheriff there for 32 years. So, he was really the only I guess you'd say politician in the family. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where I got that gene or that, that bug, but, but again, I can remember being very, very young and, uh, and being interested in politics. And uh, I, I can remember uh, going back, I'm 1964, the presidential election, and I was a Goldwater guy. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I can remember waking up uh, that morning after the election. Of course, I'd gone to bed early. I was young. and. I asked, first thing I asked my dad was, who won the election last night? He said, well, Mr. Goldwater got killed. <laughs> but I, but it, that's how young I, I remember being interested in politics. So, yeah. so, so nine years old, I don't know how many nine-year-old supporters Barry Goldwater had. But. Uh, not many, probably. Sure, sure. He certainly didn't have many over 21. Right, <laughs> <laughs> about 37%. About yeah. Um, so how, how did you, I mean, you were a relatively young man gravitating your way into, into elected elective office, uh, right. competitive politics. A little unusual. I, uh, after I finished law school in 1980, uh, I moved to Noonan. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, my mother was from there. My grandparents, my maternal grandparents were from there. And when I was in my last year of law school, I was interviewing for jobs. And I wanted to go to LaGrange or Noonan and had an opportunity with a firm in Noonan and accepted their offer and moved to Noonan. I was uh, single then, hadn't gotten married yet and moved to Noonan and uh, started practicing law with, uh, with the firm which was then Wood and Odom and uh, uh, 
practiced there beginning in 80, uh, got married in 1981, and uh, then in 1980, I was a little bit involved with the politics, local politics, nothing uh, too much. I was busy just really trying to start my career and my family. Mm -hmm. uh, we had two children pretty quickly, so we had two young children, and uh, uh, but I was interested in it, and then uh, about 85, uh, was actually approached by both the Democrats and the Republicans uh, about possibly running for uh, the state legislature. I had not run for public office before. Right. I hadn't followed the usual route where you maybe serve on a school board or serve on a county commission or city council, something like that. Uh, but I was approached uh, by, by both because they thought there might be some openings coming up in the legislature uh, in our area. And I was very interested in running. And, and so it really, at that point, uh, I had to make a decision if I was going to run, which party I was going to be involved with. And even though at that time, the Democratic Party was still dominant right. on the local scene uh, and, and the state, uh, I, I was a huge fan of Ronald Reagan, uh, had, had always voted Republican uh, uh, in elections. Actually, I voted, I can remember being in college uh, when Jimmy Carter ran, and I, I voted for Gerald Ford. Oh. Even though Carter was from Georgia, right, right. I just felt like uh, what Ford stood for, the Republican Party stood for, was what I believed in. And so I sort of became a, a Republican over the years. And uh, so when it came time to make a decision, uh, I think, frankly, to the chagrin of a lot of people, uh, uh, my, my family was concerned that making that decision probably was not the wisest political move at that time. Mm -hmm. A lot of friends said the same thing, said you can win if you run as a Democrat, I don't know if you can win if you run as a Republican, but again, I just I, that was my philosophy, that's what I believed in, and so I decided to uh, run for the state Senate uh, in 86 uh, as a Republican. So you're running in the, correct me if I'm wrong, the 28th district, correct. Uh, which was Coweta, Pike, and, and Spalding. Spalding. Mm -hmm. So a, a, a swath of you know, sort of southwest, not southwest, but south of Atlanta, west Georgia. Right. Um, tell me about that district, uh, its characteristics. Yeah, it, you know, it was an interesting district. At that time in 86, you were starting to see some growth, particularly in the Noonan area. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I moved to, to Noonan in Cavity County in 1980, we had about 42,000 people in the whole county. Of course, today you've got about 140,000, so it's grown tremendously over right. the years. But at that time, you were just starting to see the growth that was coming. The economy was good. Growth was coming more so in, in Noonan and Coweta than, say, Spalding. Spalding was still uh, very much like LaGrange, a textile town, right. uh, really dependent on, on the textile industry over there. And Pike was very rural, very rural. So you had sort of a suburban kind of feel to Noonan a little bit, uh, more traditional uh, area in Spalding and Pike being rural. So it was, it was not a homogenous district by any means. Uh, it, it had a, each county had its differences. Right, right. So tell me about that campaign. You drew, you drew um, a tough challenger. Um, well, I, I, I did. Uh, the The... It's, it's, it's unusual in, in that um, when I started off running, um, I, I announced I was running against the incumbent, Kyle Cobb, who right. was from Griffin and Spalding County. Uh, we started the campaign. I didn't have any primary opposition. He didn't have any primary opposition, so it was really just going to go to November. But we started campaigning very early in the spring and, of course, in the summer. Um, Senator Cobb had had some health issues in the past. Uh, my understanding was when we qualified to run, he was, he was fine and he was healthy and, and he, of course he was ready to run and he was campaigning. Uh, I will never forget, I, uh, it was right around Labor Day, I was uh, over uh, at the Griffin High football game standing outside the stadium handing out cards mm -hmm. to the crowd as they came in, uh, campaign cards, and I was told that uh, Senator Cobb had, had passed away. And, uh, uh, so, um, that, that was a shock, uh, under the rules, uh, of course, at the time, I didn't realize, I didn't know what that meant. Right. We did some quick research over the weekend, and under the rules and the law, the Democratic Party was allowed to nominate someone to run. Right. Uh, even though that nobody else had run against Senator Cobb in the Democratic primary. 
Well, about two days later, lo and behold, they announced that uh, the former Attorney General Arthur Bolton, who was a native of uh, Griffin in Spalding County, who had retired as Attorney General and lived in Spalding County, was going to be the Democratic nominee for the state Senate. So I went from running against the incumbent to running against the uh, former Attorney General who served, gosh, I think 30, probably 30-some-odd 30 years. He was definitely a household name. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, so across the state. That was, that was uh, intimidating, to say the least. How, how did that change uh, sort of the, the, the political calculus of your uh, campaign? We, we had felt all along that, that what we had to do in, in terms of breaking down the race, that, that you know, we figured either Senator Cobb or then, then uh, Mr. Bolton would win Spalding County. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the question was, was I going to win bigger in Coweta than they were going to win in Spalding, and then Pike County sort of hoped to break even. Right. And, and uh, so the calculus from that standpoint really didn't change that much. We, we knew we had to run up some good numbers in Coweta. The concern, again, was being a Republican, could I do that in Coweta County? Coweta was starting, we, we had a House member, Neil Shepard, uh, who was really the first Republican elected in our area. Uh, so we had one House member who was Republican, but Coweta was still somewhat uh, Democratic-leaning. I can remember going to, around campaigning some of my neighbors, who I knew very well, lived right across the street from me. Uh, these were older ladies who had been voting Democrat and voting straight ticket. Back then you could vote a straight right. ticket. And they'd been doing that since the 40s. And I actually had to show them, physically take a ballot and show them how you could vote a straight Democratic ticket but also vote for me on the Republican side. I, I, it was that ingrained in a lot oh, of people. Oh, sure. Definitely. So we had a lot to overcome. But um, I felt like we had a lot of energy. Uh, and 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 we we had several debates with uh, Mr. Bolton. I want to say at least two, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we just we just kept working hard and and uh, uh, you know managed managed to win. It was like a very close race. I think I got I don't remember fifty two percent maybe fifty one fifty two percent, but uh, it, it was close. We knew it was going to be close. I ended up carrying Coweta fairly well. I think he slightly beat me in Spalding and, and Pike. He may have beat me just a tad in Pike, but the margin in Coweta was enough uh, for us to win. Uh, the other thing I remember was the night of the election, the returns were coming in. We got the Coweta returns. We got the Spalding County returns, waiting on Pike. It, at the time, it was looking pretty good, but you, you, know, you weren't sure. And we were in Noonan at my campaign headquarters and had some of my supporters down in Pike County, and they called and said that... Uh, they hadn't finished counting the votes. It was getting late. They were going to finish counting them the next day. <laughs> and to which we said, uh, no, you're not. We're fixing to come down there if we need to uh, because, you know, you, you were concerned about what might happen. And uh, they finished counting the votes. And th at that point, uh, late that night, we, we were confirmed that as, as the winner. Now, you said you were, you were recruited by both parties. Uh, what was your interaction with the, the state Republican Party during your campaign? What sort of assistance uh, was available? They, they in the gave 80s? some assistance. Uh, the state party did. Uh, I talked to uh, Senator Coverdale, then State right. Senator Paul Coverdale, uh, uh, Fred Cooper, uh, some some of the some of the uh, leadership of the state party at that time. Uh, my campaign manager uh, was John Stuckey, who later became the That's chairman right. of the state That's party. Right. And and I will tell you, I could not have won that race without the help of John Stuckey. John was a political veteran. He had run big time races in, in Tennessee and Louisiana and elsewhere and he had moved to Noonan and he was one of the ones that came to me and, and approached me about running. He had mm -hmm. heard that I was interested and he approached me and John really helped me organize that campaign. Uh, uh, I, I had no idea how to organize a campaign. I never had run for anything. I was 31 years old Right. and uh, John helped me organize it and he organized a team. Uh, we had uh, not only help from the state party, uh, we also had help from, um, from the local party. The local party was beginning to get strong. We had a good team of volunteers, people to put your signs out, people to do the mailers, all the, the grunt work that's got to be done in a campaign. We had a good team. And that freed me up to go around and, and, and meet people and talk to people. 
Now, this is a bit of a leading question, but mm. do you think it was that you know that ground game, uh, and also you know sort of the professional expertise that Mr. Stuckey brought? Because 1986 was not a Republican year, either either nationally or in Georgia. The the, the party lost, I, I think, at least half a dozen legislative seats in 1986. Why do you think you were able as a, as as a first time office seeker to win? Well, gosh, that's, that's hard to say. Uh, Reagan was still president mm -hmm. and still very popular. Matter of fact, uh, he flew into Columbus and they managed to get me down there and, and get my picture with him coming off Air Force One and we put that in the paper uh, all over the district. I don't think sure. that hurt. Sure, sure. Uh, but uh, I, I will tell you, I, I think we, we managed to, to win. Uh, we, just, we just outworked them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I literally, there's no telling how many doors I knocked on personally. I mean, I would get up in the morning and drive over to Griffin or drive over to Pike County and a lot of times by myself, sometimes a lot of volunteers and just go door to door. I didn't have a list of who was registered, who wasn't. I just went door to door. Uh, I can remember a lot of Saturdays starting about nine o'clock in the morning, going to about six at night, door to door. Wow. Yeah. And in the hot, <laughs> it's, it's hard work. Uh, you've got to really want it, want it to do it. But I spent a lot of time in, in, in Griffin and Spalding and, and, um, and Pike County working and getting to know the people over there. I think the people of Pike County really appreciate I don't think they'd been paid a whole lot of attention to before then. And I think they really appreciated the fact that I was interested in what their concerns were, what their issues were, and I was spending a lot of time over there. Right. Uh, the local newspaper. I got to be very good friends with, with the publisher of the paper, and they, frankly, were, were very supportive, mm -hmm. and uh, and then same time the Republican Party in in, uh, in Spalding County was coming on. Uh, they had a pretty good organization over there, and I got some help from a lot of their folks, and so we had a pretty good pretty good ground game. Uh, and I think we just the shoe leather, and we just we just outworked them. Whereas the Democrats, I think, may have taken it a little bit for granted uh, once Mr. Bolton got in the race, and they did the traditional, you know, they put up some billboards and you know that kind of thing. But we were out, I mean, every day meeting people. And I knew, I sort of got a feeling when I started running into people, say, downtown in Griffin or Noonan or wherever, and I'd go to shake their hand, and they'd say, you know, you came by my house, knocked on my door. And when I, when I, started, when I started hearing that a lot, I said, okay, I'm, just, I'm starting to make some connections here. And I felt like then we were starting to really um, make some progress. Did you do any campaigning with uh, Senator Mattingly in 86? Who was, he was running for re-election. He was. Uh, no, uh, I didn't. He, he, uh, Mattingly, if you'll recall, I think he sort of took the approach. He sort of stayed in D.C., which he was later, I think, criticized for. He was. He uh, was. But he, he sort of stayed above the fray a little bit. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a great story. Sure. That involves this. It, 86 was when Mattingly, White's Fowler was challenging Mac Mattingly. Right. The first week I had qualified. I came up to Atlanta and qualified. Uh, so, okay, I'm here. I'm ready to go. What do I do next? So I woke up that Saturday morning and I told my wife, I said, well, I think I'm going to go over to Griffin this morning and start meeting people. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I was going to do. I got in my car, I drove across the line, and as I crossed the Cavity Spalding line, there was a little um, little country grocery store there. Right. The uh, old school grocery store, the kind with the Marita, Marita bed, bread uh, doors, <laughs> screen doors, you right, know. Right, right. All that that you don't see as many of no, anymore. No, no. But I walked in Saturday morning, and it looked like a scene out of a Norman Rockwell painting. There were three older guys, had on the bib overalls, farmers, sitting back there on some coke crates just chewing the fat that Saturday morning. And I walked in and walked back there and I stuck out my hand and I said, I'm running for the state. I said, I'm running for the Senate. And I stuck my hand out and one of them said, we know who you are and, we, and we're for you. And I said, really? All and right. they said, and the other one said, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we, we're going to support you. And then the third one reached in his overalls and pulled out a hundred dollars bill and gave me a contribution right there. I'd known them 30 seconds. So I'm thinking, you know, this is, uh, Shoot, I'm maybe better, this is easier. <laughs> I'm, I'm better known over here than I thought I was. I was feeling really good. So I chatted for a few minutes. And I said, well, finally, I said, well, thank y'all very much. I appreciate it. And uh, please tell your friends, oh, yeah, we're going to back you. We're going to back you. 
and this is true stories. I turned around, I was walking out, and right when I hit the doors to walk outside back to my car, I heard one of them say to the other one, he said, you know that White's Fowler's taller than I thought he was. They thought I was White's Fowler. <laughs> and I stopped, and I started to turn around, but I said no, and I just kept on going. And uh, about 20 years later, I was at a lunch with White, oh. and I knew he was going to be there, and I told that story, and I paid him back the $100 that that gentleman had given me. So that, that shows you kind of what was going on. Uh, right. The, Senate, the U.S. Senate race was big, but, but it just started. But I had a long way to go to, as far as name ID in, over in Griffin and Spalding County. Now, to be fair, once you did win uh, election, uh, you didn't really face much, much opposition. Uh, uh, once you were in office. You... Well, I ran, I ran five times. Mm -hmm. I had opposition three times. Uh, the first time was against uh, Mr. Bolton. Uh, the second time I ran, the, the, the very next uh, go-round, um, after my first term, I had Republican opposition, no, excuse me, Democratic opposition that time as well. Democratic opposition that time as well. We beat them pretty well. I think mm -hmm. we beat them two to one, if I remember correctly. Yep. Then, uh, I think the next two times I was unopposed, then my last time I ran, I actually had Republican opposition from the chairman. By that time, the district had been reapportioned. Right. Uh, Pike County, I had lost Pike County. I picked up about half of Fayette County, primarily Peachtree, Peachtree. City, Tyrone, that area. And the chairman of the uh, uh, Fayette County Commission ran against me in the Republican primary, uh, a fellow by the name of Steve Wallace. And... Uh, and uh, so we, we battled it out in the primary, and we beat him about two to one again. I want to say maybe, maybe no, actually better than that, I think. So, so three out of the five times I had opposition. So what made you run afoul of, uh, of the party there, or, or was it just a, he thought he'd give it a go? I, I think at that time, uh, Fayette County had grown a lot. They had really n never had uh, the senator from their area, it always been centered, always been for me, the Noonan or Griffin or somewhere. And I think it was more, I don't think it was more of a, a Republican thing or inter-party thing. It was Fayette County, at least some faction of Fayette County, right, saying right. we're bigger, uh, we have more population in Coweta uh, and Griffin, we ought to have the senator from this area. Uh, but we put together a good team over there, had good support from a lot of local elected officials. Uh, uh, I remember the sheriff, among others, were very supportive. Uh, some of the county commissioners, uh, even even some of Mr. Wallace's colleagues, and uh, and we put together a good campaign. Uh, but it was it was more Fayette County saying, "Hey, we think it's our time to have the senator." But but we won, uh, and I, I, you know, matter of fact, I can remember running an ad in the campaign. I'd gotten money put in the budget the year before to build them a brand new library in Peachtree City. So. We, we, we ran that in the ad showing that we were effective and we were looking after Fayette County and, and, and uh, tended to our business over there. And, and it was much like Pike County before, they appreciated that and they saw that, that hopefully we were, we were effective in the state Senate representing them, so it paid off. So tell me about the, the, the state Senate, the legislature um, in the 1980s. As, you, as we've already mentioned, the, the Republicans were a distinct minority <laughs> yeah. party. Yeah. Uh, what, was, what was it like to be a member of the minority in the legislature. It was tough. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not, uh, of course I'd never served before, but I was not used to being in, in, in the minority. Uh, I can remember my first caucus meeting after I won. Uh, Senator Coverdale, who was a minority leader, called a caucus meeting. This would have been uh, late November, early December and uh, of 86. And I came to the Capitol and I walked in and there were nine people in the room, nine out of 56, and I, I, that's when it hit me. I said, my, <laughs> my gosh, we've got a long way to go. They were great folks. Uh, you know, Senator Coverdale, you, you wouldn't find anybody better than that, but it's some, good, some good men and women, but we had nine seats out of the 56. So that was disheartening or, uh, or intimidating to say the least, yeah. And of course, you didn't ha you didn't have to contend with with Speaker Murphy uh, uh, like your colleagues in the House did, but not, not as often anyway. How how did you try to maneuver or or or, or work when, when you're down, you know, almost six to one? Well, 
my philosophy then, and it, and it, it is now, is that I try to work with everybody. I try to work across the aisle. I knew that if I was going to get something done for my uh, constituents, for my district, that I, I couldn't be down there uh, being a total partisan Republican, uh, you know, throwing bombs and, and, and that sort of thing. I mean, I certainly stood up for our principles and, and what the party stands for, but I tried to do it in a professional way, uh, in, 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 a, in a way that, that uh, I could make my point, but at the same time, you know, not make enemies. And so I, I, had, I, had, I had to work across the, work across the aisle and, and, and do things like, you know, for instance, the money for the library in Peachtree City. Uh, we, we got some other projects done in Coweta and, and uh, uh, Pike County. Um, so, you know, we, we, we take our lumps on some of the big issues and some, right. some of the uh, real philosophical issues. But the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, a lot of those issues, I said, you know, these aren't partisan issues. A lot of these things aren't partisan uh, if you approach them. And frankly, in 1987, 90, 1988, the Democratic Party was not as liberal as it is now. Right, right. So that made it a little easier to work sometimes with them because you take some of those guys from South Georgia, even though they were Democrats, they were every bit as conservative as most of the Republicans were. So you try to reach out to them, work with them, and, uh, and, and I think my training as a lawyer helped in that way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a lawyer, you're used to going into court and you're battling the other side, you're battling the other lawyer. You learn not to take it personally. You, you fight and, and you scratch and you do everything you can to win. But when it's over, it's over. You shake hands, maybe go have a beer, and uh, then the next time you, you do it all over again. I did the same thing uh, during my career in the legislature. You know, I, I would fight very hard for what I believed in and, and the bills I wanted to see passed or, or the ones I opposed, I'd fight against very hard. But when it was over, it was over. I didn't take it personally. I didn't hold a grudge because you're always going to have another vote. You're, you're, you're always, you may, the person you're fighting, you may need that same vote right. tomorrow on something else. And I, tr I tried to keep that in mind. And, but I think uh, being a lawyer uh, helped in that regard. Because I've seen over the years um, people sometimes who don't have legal training, it doesn't come as natural to them. They, they, if, they, if someone opposes them, they take it personally. Right. Uh, they, they, they can't let go of it, and they can't move on to the next issue sometimes. And I think it's important you've got to be able to do that. What was it like uh, with, with Zell Miller? Um, as He was lieutenant governor. Uh, he was. From 75 to 91 when he was sworn in for, right. for, as governor. Um, how was as, as serving under Zell Miller and, and Pierre Howard? How was that different? Very two, different. Two, yeah, two very, very, very different. different. Two different, two totally different personalities. Right. Zell, I, I, I've told people before, Zell Miller probably knew more about state government than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, he knew every nook and cranny of state government. He knew if you turn this screw over here, some, this wheel over here would move. I mean, he 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 knew it, and Zell Zell was. I'll have to say, um, uh, courteous to me, nice to me. Uh, he certainly treated me and the other Republicans much better than Speaker Murphy did the Republicans in the House, no doubt about that. Uh, now, there was a limit. I mean, I knew, <laughs> you know, he wasn't going <laughs> to let us just run over him or, or, or do whatever we wanted to. But, but for the most part, it was, it was fairly uh, congenial. And, and I think that one reason was the Republican numbers were so low we weren't seen as that much of a threat. You could afford to be nice. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but but you, I could I could go talk to Zell and about things and uh, and and you know he he he. Uh, I've always had a lot of respect for Zell. And I, I still do. He, he he's one of the best politicians you I've ever seen. Uh, then he ran for governor, was elected. Pierre Howard was elected lieutenant governor. Of course, Pierre had been in the Senate before then. I had the advantage of having been uh, a fraternity brother of Pierre's younger brother. So uh, I, I, I'd gotten to know Pierre that way and, uh, and, and were friends with his family even before I got to the legislature. So when we were colleagues in the Senate, Pierre and I were very friendly and, and, and good friends and served, uh, actually he was chair of the health committee and I was on that committee. Uh, so we worked together on a lot of things. Um, uh, Pierre and I both worked uh, hard on some environmental legislation uh, for the Chattahoochee River. 
Uh, he had an interest in, he had an interest in it from a pure environmental standpoint. I had an interest in it, frankly, not only from an environmental standpoint, but the fact it ran right through my district. And we were trying to get it cleaned up, but he and I had worked together on that. And then when he became Lieutenant Governor, uh, he did something that had never happened in the history of the state of Georgia. He appointed me, a Republican, as a chairman of a standing committee. That had never happened. He caught a little flack from some of his colleagues. I can remember being at the, uh, when he announced it, we were later at the, the inauguration party, and his, uh, I went up to speak to his mother, and she was laughing. She said, you know you've got my son in a lot of trouble, don't you? I said, I know that, but we'll, we'll, we're going to work through that. But she was, she was a bit kidding and me. This was the, the Special Judiciary? Special Judiciary Committee, yeah. What, what, what because you caught some flack too. I did from from your Republican, well, some Republican colleagues, yeah. not not everybody, obviously. I did. They thought I was maybe getting too close with the Democratic side, and and I caught a little flack on that. I will tell you, uh, I've still got in my home somewhere in a box somewhere a letter I got from Johnny Isaacson, who was in the House at that time. Right. Probably was a minority leader at that time. I, I, I be, yeah, I believe he was. But anyway, he was in the House. I have a handwritten note from Johnny Iverson on that issue saying, Skin, you did the right thing. If you offer that position, you've got a chance to influence the agenda and, and, and move our agenda forward. Uh, he said, I, I think you did the right thing. That meant a lot to me. And of right. course, that's typical of Johnny. But, uh, but, but I remember that. But So yeah, I caught, Pierre caught some flack. I caught some flack. But it, it, it worked uh, pretty smoothly. And... Since that time, to this day, uh, traditionally, the uh, Republicans, since they've taken over uh, the, the Senate, um, they have at least one Democrat as a chair of a committee. It's just been something that's, that's kind of continued. But, but uh, my situation was the first time that had happened. You mentioned uh, environmental legislation, something you you came to be known for uh, what? What were the other you know legislative or policy goals that you and the party tried to implement um, as as your numbers grew? Yeah, the, it, the numbers grew. The numbers grew pretty quickly. Georgia yeah. was changing. Uh, again, when I got there in '87, there were nine of us. Uh, I think when I left in '96, we'd gotten up to 21, 22, right in there. So mm -hmm. you know, it, tremendous change. We, so we weren't at a majority yet, but we were getting closer and closer. And of course, it was, it was starting to get the, the Democrats were feeling the heat on that. And so it was getting a little more partisan and, and, and a little, probably a little uh, more rough and tumble into politics. But the, the agenda we had was, was sort of mirrored the national Republican agenda. Uh, we, we wanted uh, to do some tax reform. We wanted to do some education reform. Uh, you know, when we came in, the, the, the Georgia schools were, were not ranked very, very high nationally. Um, and we were trying to do some, some more things uh, to help there. Uh, we felt like uh, the taxes could, could uh, be improved. I introduced the bill to take the sales tax off of, of groceries uh, one year. It didn't go anywhere. And then the next year, Zell took it and, and passed it. And, uh, so, uh, you know, that, it, that happened not, a lot. Not the only Republican idea that that, that happened. No, that happened a lot. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we had a good idea, so a lot, they, they a lot of times would appropriate it. And I, and I understood how the game worked. Uh, I can remember the, the, the hard part when I got to be minority leader uh, my last four years and Zell was governor, it, it was hard to get to the right of Zell Miller. He was very conservative. I mean, he was out there with three strikes and you're out and tax cuts mm -hmm. and all this. And I can remember he would give his state of the state address and then we would deliver a response to it. And we'd have about an hour to, and I can remember myself and Steve Stansel, who was the major, uh, minority leader in the house that time. And we would get in my office and we would sit there and go, How, what are we gonna say? He's up here proposing to cut taxes, get tough on crime. I mean, all these Republican ideas and uh, it made it hard, but we would go out and we would, we would uh, do the best we could on that. And invariably, I'd finish the press conference and we'd attack this, attack that. I'd finish the press conference, I'd come in, and about two minutes later, the phone would ring and it would be Zell hollering at me, saying, why are you, why are you opposing this, opposing that? And I, I'd say, Governor, you know, I'm the minority leader, I've got to give our point of view on this, but he, he would come after me pretty hard <laughs> at, at that point. But it was, it was, you know, part of the, part of the process. 
Now, how much collaboration did you have? You mentioned Steve Stancil, uh, Steve Stancil, Bob Irvin. How yep. much how much coordination or a collaboration lot. was there among the le the leadership? There, there was a lot. Uh, um, we, we we talked a good bit. We talked about candidate recruitment. Mm -hmm. We talked about issues. Uh, we we talked about uh, trying to grow the party uh, any way we could. Uh, so. You know, oftentimes there were events around the state, and I'd be there, Steve would be there, Bob Irvin would be there, other Republicans would be there, uh, and uh, it, 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 was, uh, it, it was a collaborative effort. Uh, we, worked, we worked very well together and got along well. Um, you know, we were a minority, we had to. We had to. Um, you know, so unfortunately, sometimes what happens now is, uh, and, and this is true with the Democrats, when the Democrats were in control, they would fight among themselves, uh, even though they were all Democrats. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes, you, with the Republicans in control, you see them fighting among themselves, even though they're all Republicans. Right. And, uh, but, but at the time, when we were coming through, we were in the minority, and uh, although we were gaining ground, and you could sort of see the trend, you could see where it was going, and the Democrats were seeing the trend. Um, we, we, had to, we had to work together, and, and, and we did. And uh, we, we got, we, we, got each other's back. Uh, if there was an issue or a problem, we covered each other and then um, and, and moved forward. And, and I, think, I think it paid dividends uh, you know, just a few years down that road when, when all of a sudden we became the majority. Now, did this collaboration extend to the state party leadership as well? Alec Poitavin, yep. Billy Lovett, uh, yep. you know, yep. Rusty worked, Paul? Worked, worked very well with them. You, you had John Stuckey, who I mentioned. Right. You had Poitavin, you, you, Rusty Paul. They all worked very well. Uh, Jay Morgan, who was who was uh, worked with the party, worked very right. closely with us. Uh, and, you know, they they would they would identify maybe a candidate in a certain area they thought would be a good candidate and ask me or someone else to go down and meet with them and talk to them a little bit about uh, running and what was involved and, and and that sort of thing. So yeah, I, the state party uh, at that point uh, was run very very well and and. Uh, did a great job of, of getting the word around and recruiting candidates and, and, and growing our numbers in the legislature. So I, uh, kudos to all those folks that, that, were, that led the party then, Port of it, and uh, Billy and John and the rest of them. I guess David Schaefer was probably executive he, director at he the was, time. He was. Jay Morgan was for a while, then Schaefer came in after him. Uh, you know, it's funny how many people you see that were involved then, now that they're in other positions. John Watson, the, the chairman of the party now, was exactly, involved. Exactly, exactly. But you know, the other interesting thing is, uh, you look back, even when we were a minority, we were recruiting candidates and getting good candidates to run, and, and while uh, I was in the Senate, uh, one candidate we recruited, young guy out of Gainesville, Casey Cagle, he ran. They never elected a Republican up there. He ran and won. Of course, now he's lieutenant governor. Another candidate who came out of Blue Ridge, who's, who was elected to the Senate, David Ralston, who's now the Speaker of the House. Another candidate down in Columbus, Clay Land. Mm -hmm. He served in the legislature. He's now a federal judge down there. Uh, Chuck Clay out of Marietta right. ran and, and won and has, has served uh, the state party since then. and, and uh, has run statewide. Governor Deal. And then well, Governor Deal, uh, of course, was a Democrat then. Sure, But sure. he was a pro tem of the Senate and was very well respected at that time as, as he is now. And I worked very closely with Governor Deal. So I had a chance to serve literally in the legislature in the 80s and early 90s with the now current governor, the now current lieutenant governor, and the now current speaker. So so there's a lot, a lot of them have gone on to Big and better things. Right, right. Um, early, late '80s, early '90s. Um, the party's growing, but the party's also changing. Uh, the Republican Party, mm -hmm. Democrats, Democrats as well. But yep. you know, as a Republican, it, do you recall the sort of influx of, of, of what what scholars call the Christian right, the religious right? I do. Uh, very contentious at the time. Um, can you explain the process of sort of you know? Bring, bringing those new folks in and sort of the, the process of amalgamating you know, one party? It, it, it was tricky. Um, you, you did see an influx during that time of, of the so-called Christian coalition. Right. And, uh, and they were very, very involved. Um, the, the good news was that, that, that they brought a lot of people to the party, a lot of voters to the primaries. Uh, they were very 
aggressive. Uh, and that's when you started seeing really, for the first time, uh, Republican primaries. Uh, generally before then, you'd have one Republican in sure. the primary. Uh, but, but the Christian Coalition, they started recruiting their own candidates to run um, and, uh, and, and sometimes run against incumbent Republicans in the primaries. And that, that got to be a little, you know, a little dicey uh, sometimes because you, you'd, have, you'd have a colleague who had, you had served with and all of a sudden they've got opposition, it's Republican opposition, uh, and so it, 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 made it, it made it sometimes a little tricky. But, but um, I think overall, uh, the fact that they brought the numbers to the party, uh, they brought some good, good ideas and, and, and good messages to the party. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem I saw was, frankly, at, at the state party level and, 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 and at the local party levels, huge fights over who was going to control the apparatus there. Right. Huge fights. I mean, some of the conventions uh, were unbelievable and uh, the fights that went on. And, uh, and I know, for instance, our local party in Coweta County, which had been a tremendous organization, it was just just uh, any, in, anything a candidate needed, as I mentioned before, in terms of signs, mailings, uh, fundraising, whatever had to be done, the behind the scenes work, we had a tremendous organization. Uh, there, there was a faction of uh, Christian coalition members that, that, that came in and sort of took over the, the party mm -hmm. locally. Uh, they, they, they packed the uh, the district and the, the county and the district meetings and got their people elected. And uh, next thing you know, they're in charge. And uh, it, it, it was a little different. It was a little different. How, how did you adjust? If that's, I mean, that's an extremely difficult question. Yeah. But. I, I don't know that I adjusted a whole lot. I, I, I kept doing what I was doing. I, or maybe, think, maybe they adjusted to you. Well, I don't know if they ever did either. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think there was, a, there was a feeling among some of them uh, that I was not um, conservative enough on some social issues. Sure. Uh, and, and they did not like that. And, uh, and, and as a result, sometimes they kind of took shots at me and, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, but every time we, we ran, we managed to Get it, keep everybody together and, and, and won with comfortable margins. But, but in the interim, you know, it, it, it would get sometimes a little tense. There were, there were some issues they would press me on that, that I just didn't support. Right. And, uh, and it, it caused a little bit of friction. Uh, I, won't, I won't kid you about that. So you go back and you poke through the, the newspapers uh, from the early 90s. There's always speculation that you're going to run for Congress, you're going to run for Lieutenant Governor, you're going to yeah. run for Governor. You never did. No. Why didn't you pull the trigger on, on, on the well, statewide think, race or congressional race? Well, I, the, the first thing that came up was possibly running for Congress. Um, and that really came to a head when, um, after reapportionment, I uh, can't remember the year, but, but it was when Newt Gingrich left our district and moved up to Cobb County. 92, I believe. I, I think that's probably right. Uh, so you had an open seat. Uh, there for Congress and had a lot of people come to me and ask me about running. Frankly, I was not interested in moving to Washington. Uh, my family was young. By that point, right. I had three children. Uh, I, I was not independently wealthy. I had to, I had to work <laughs> for a living. And, and uh, you know, frankly, I just looked at the sheer cost on your family and the cost of living, just trying to Live in D.C. Yeah, three kids in D.C. Yeah. yeah, it just it. So I can remember uh, Newt called after he announced he was moving up to the Cobb County district, and he called and he had a meeting with me and Mac Collins, and who was then a state senator as right. well. And Mac and I were good friends, and uh, uh, we the three of us sat down and, and Newt told us uh, he said uh, I'm moving to Cobb. I'm gonna run up there. I want one of you two to run for my seat. And at that time, I was the minority leader. And Max said uh, to me, he said, if you want to go to D.C., I'll, I'm happy to run for minority leader of the Senate. I said, Mac, I don't want to go to D.C. You run for Congress, I'm going to stay where I am. And Mac ran and won and was a great congressman and did a great job. And uh, so it worked out, worked out well. So I, 
even though there a lot of times there was speculation I was going to run for Congress, I never really was serious about that. I just, it wasn't in my stage of life with my, my wife and my children that I just felt like I could do that. Mm -hmm. and, um, so uh, I, I passed on that. Um, the other times I looked at statewide, uh, really probably when, when Zell ran for governor the first time, he said he was going to run for one term, if you remember. Uh -huh. He pledged, he said, I'm going to run for one term, and that's, that's it. And so the expectation was at that time that Zell would run one term, then Pierre was probably going to run for governor, and then had that happened, I probably would have run for lieutenant governor that time. Uh, as it happened, Zell changed his mind, ran for a second term. Uh, then when he, when he uh, term limited out, uh, Pierre initially announced for governor. Uh, I was approached about running for, for, for governor. Um, Isaacson uh, decided to run and I supported mm -hmm. Johnny. And uh, uh, it, was, it, 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 was a, it was a good campaign. Johnny, Johnny was not able to win. Democrats still had a little bit of advantage in the state. Uh, uh, I, one of the biggest compliments I ever got in my life was I was at a dinner after, after that, and I remember Tom Allgood, who was former majority leader in the Senate from Augusta, who I'd served with, uh, he told me later that he said, uh, we were glad you didn't run. We, we were scared you, you might run. And I, I said, well, I appreciate that because <laughs> uh, I thought hard about it, and I, and I almost did. And uh, then, uh, so that, those two times came up, and then after that, I'd been in the Senate 10 years and decided I was going to leave the Senate and uh, get into something else. So, so the, the t time is everything in politics, and again, had Zell stepped down to one term, I, I probably would have run statewide. Uh, but it didn't happen, and that's fine. I'm, I'm <laughs> I enjoyed what I've, I, my service in the Senate, and I enjoy what I'm doing now. So things have worked out fine. What's your best memory uh, of the Senate? If you had to pick one that that, that really sticks out uh, to you? Well, I guess I'll answer that two ways. Uh, the, the, probably the greatest thing are the friendships you make. Mm -hmm. uh, you really get, when you go through something like that, serving in the legislature with all this involved there and the pressures of a campaign and the pressures of serving, uh, you get very close to people. You make a lot of good friends. So so probably overall the best thing was the friends you make and, and of course the opportunity to, to serve your district and, and the people. And I, and I felt like we did some good things for, for my district. So I felt good about my service and I felt real good about uh, the friends I make that, that are still friends today. As far as memory, a specific memory, I can remember, uh, I, I guess it was my last year, I'm not sure it was my last year or not, but it was like day 40 at about 11.30 at night, the time is winding down, we've got a bill in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Senate and it's a tight vote and I'm up in the well, um, debating the bill, we're opposed to the bill, and uh, the Democrats, I mean, at that point, if you've been there the last night about 11.30, things are getting a little crazy, and it's heated, and people are tired, and they're anxious, and tempers are a little short, and I'm up there debating against this bill, speaking against this bill, and I've, I've got Democrats screaming at me from their seats in the Senate. Some of the people in the House have come over so that the whole the whole walls of the Senate were circled by the people. Uh, and, and I remember looking up and the lights are coming down and all these people around me and I, and I thought to myself while I was doing this, I thought this must be what being in a boxing match feels like because of the intensity and all the people hollering and, and, and it, it, was just, it was just very intense but it was fun. Mm -hmm. I liked it and we, ended, we ended up winning. And that was a big thing back then when we were in the minority. We beat the bill and, and uh, but that was Probably one of the highlights. Just, it, I just, I enjoyed that part of it. I enjoyed debating the bills, amending the bills, doing the parliamentary maneuvering. Right. I enjoyed all of that. Any thought of ever going back? And no, mm. no. I, you know, I, I do lobbying work now. Right. And that keeps me very close to the process. Uh, it keeps me close to the people who I like. It keeps me close to the process, which I really like. 
Uh, and the nice thing is I don't have to run every two years. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Now, now, did you remain active in party politics? After I got out of the Senate? Mm -hmm. Not really, uh, for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, uh, I, when I left the Senate, I joined uh, Georgia Link, my lobbying firm. And so, you know, I didn't, when, when, you're, when you're lobbying, you're, you're talking to both Republicans and Democrats. Sure. And uh, as we say, we're, we're, we're not a Republican or Democrat, we're agnostic now. But, uh, but no, you've got to work with both sides. And so I didn't stay real active in party politics um, for, for, for that reason. Uh, and, and, and frankly, the other reason was uh, I, I was a little um, uh, disenchanted with, with, frankly, how some of the state party politics were going. Um, I thought it had gotten a little too far to the right and, and uh, uh, was on a trajectory and a, and a uh, place that I personally, I didn't, with my politics, I didn't feel comfortable with. Hmm. So, yeah. The Republican Party, um, growing steadily in the 1980s, really explodes in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. What factors do you do you attribute that that rapid uh, pace of growth to? I think the growth of the state of Georgia. Number one, you had people moving into this state who from other places who had been Republicans, and uh, they they naturally voted Republican. Number one, I think. Number two. Uh, and I've mentioned this a couple times already, but I, but I think I think Ronald Reagan did more to change change things than, than probably anybody I've ever seen. I think he people uh, who were young when he was president, uh, a lot of them were inspired by him, and, and I think that carried over. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, things went well in the country under Reagan by and large, and you saw the country sort of shift. And people got people in Georgia got used to voting Republican at the top of the ticket, and they started voting Republican all the way down. At the same time, the state party was doing a very good job of recruiting candidates, uh, and you saw that in the metro area, where a lot of the Republicans live, kept growing and growing. And as a result, you know, you started just building out. First, you started getting elected in Metro Atlanta, then it started going out to Noonan and mm -hmm. Griffin, and then going up to North Georgia, and it just it just uh, spiraled from there. So. It was a combination of things. Uh, I think from the national level all the way down to the state and local level, um, uh, the, the, the uh, organization was good, but the issues were good, and the Republicans seemed to be on the right side of the issues mm -hmm. at, at that time. Uh, at the same time, I think the Democrats at the state level were gradually moving a little more left. They had, they had been fairly conservative. When Murphy was in and Zell was in, you know, pretty conservative. You started seeing it move more and more to the left. Um, and I, I think some people, uh, the voters saw that and, and again started switching. Do you think that's why the, the Georgia Democrat, now of course, uh, Georgia didn't elect its first Republican governor, post-Reconstruction governor, uh, until 2002. Right. Is, is that what you attribute the Democrats' uh, sticking power? Um, that they were able to, you know, sort of project themselves as sort of a centrist, center-right party? They, they did a good job of holding that coalition together for a long time. I mean, they had a coalition of basically South Georgia conservatives and urban liberals. Right. And they held that thing together for a long time, and, and, but finally it just it frayed. It had already frayed at the national level. Right. And, that, you know, that's when you saw... You saw a Nathan Deal, who was a Democrat in Georgia, when he got to D.C. and he saw what was going on at the national level, he said, I, I don't even recognize this party here. He switched. Uh, that's when you saw later Zell Miller switch. Uh, but but, the, but the, the change are taking place at the national level, and you started seeing a little, bit, a little bit of that at the local level. I say the local, the state level. It took a little longer to take place here. Uh, Zell Miller, uh, Pierre Howard. Roy Barnes did a pretty good job of holding that coalition together, mm -hmm. Tom Murphy, but then Tom Murphy got beat and it just, it came apart. Mm -hmm. It just unraveled and, and that's what happened. So the, the, the Republican Party has been in charge, uh, in control of state government since you know, the governor's mansion since 03, legislature since 03, 05, right. both houses since 05. Right. Uh, what would you, how would you describe the governing philosophy of the Republican majority? 
it's, I think it's been uh, very, very conservative in terms of uh, economics, budget, uh, taxes. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think they've, they've definitely been conservative there. Uh, at the same time, um, you, you, see, you see a lot less legislation go through the process all the way now than you used to. I think how, do you, how do you mean? just the sheer volume of bills and, and not only introduced that are passed mm -hmm. now has gone down fairly dramatically since Republicans took over. Uh, I mean, I can remember when I was in the Senate, we, when the Democrats were in control, we would have, oh gosh, just pages of bills to vote on a lot of days. You see a lot less legislation now. I think Republicans tend, tend to focus on fewer but bigger issues to try to deal with and try to uh, concentrate on those. You don't mm -hmm. see the volume like you used to, which I think the public likes. Uh, I think the public will tell you that pretty much we've got probably about as many laws as we need and we don't need too many more. <laughs> but uh, the average Georgian will say that. And there's certainly there's some areas you can, you can improve on. But, but overall, I think Republicans have, have tried to, to, to be conservative uh, with the budget and, and, and frankly, just on, on laws in general. Um, and, and a little less is better approach. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, you know factions uh, a little while ago. Yeah. Those factions do do you know, sort of emerge every once in a while, yeah. um, especially on contentious issues, uh, not unlike the ones you were dealing with in the nineteen nineties on social issues and stuff like. Yeah. Do you think that's a a, a, a concern uh, for either the state or the party? Um, that sort of rift over, you know, religious liberty, for yeah. example, or, or the the campus carry is law now, but right. it wasn't, or Confederate monuments, it's, things it's like a, it's that. It's a big concern, it's, and, and that's part of that comes with being the governing party. You're going to have that sort of thing. It's 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 a lot easier when you're a minority. You can you can throw the bombs and you can do this and do that, and and but when you don't have to govern, it's tougher when you've got to govern and you've got to make the trains run on time and right. you, you get a budget done and all those things. But you do see these rifts, and it makes it hard on, on, at, at this point in the Republican Party. The biggest thing, when I, was, when I was in, the thing that used to frustrate me the most was, uh, particularly on the social issues, was a lot of the uh, Christian conservatives, uh, you, could, you could vote with them nine out of ten times. But if you didn't vote with them one time out of those ten, uh, they, they, they considered you uh, the enemy, almost. Uh, it, was, it was sort of an all or nothing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they took that approach on legislation. And by design, the way the system's designed, you can't do that. To get a, a bill moved through the system, there's going to have to be some compromises, there's going to have to be some give and take. That's the way the system is set up. And again, sometimes when you try to do that, uh, they would they would come after you when you were going to get them eighty percent of what they were looking for, and Reagan used to say, you know, I'll get eighty percent now, then I'll come back and I'll get ten, then I'll get ten. It's very hard to get one hundred percent all at once. That was frustrating to me as a minority leader. It's frustrating to me as a, a sitting senator, and frankly, it was frustrating to me as as a, just as a Republican uh, that 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 approach was taken. Uh, you've got to compromise sometimes, and and you can't get it all. Uh, usually, and, and let's let's make incremental change mm -hmm. as opposed to overnight change, which is difficult to achieve. You s see the same thing now a lot of times with the Tea Party, which was, you know, sort of follow the the, the, the uh, Christian conservatives. Um, uh, they came in; they were a faction. Uh, they were interested uh, in a lot of economic issues, but uh, but again, they they have this litmus test that if that if you're not with them. 100% every time, then, then they're going to they're gonna try to get somebody to run against you, or they're going to attack you, they're going to come after you. Whereas again, generally the way you've got to do it to get something done is to try to move it through the process and, and, and take, sometimes you've got to take what you can get and come back next year for, uh, for another bite. And so you see that right now, frankly it's hurting both parties, I mean it's hurting both parties. but but. From the Republican standpoint, you see that right now, where uh, you, you see it, at, particularly at the national level, 
uh, but at the state level too, that, that if you don't vote a certain way, uh, even though you may have voted in that same vein five or 10 times, if you don't, when the 11th time comes up, if you don't do it, then, then you're a bad guy, which Wait. is not fair to me. And, it, and it's not, it's not conducive for getting things done. Well, I, and, and that leads me to my next point is, you know, you, you see at the, at the national level, um, I mean, mm -hmm. relatively unprecedented gridlock. Yep. Um, why do you think that the Republican leadership in Georgia has thus far, for the most part, been able to avoid the sort of gridlock, um, even within the ca its own caucus? They, they, I think, I think two, two reasons. One, they've had good leadership. Uh, uh, Speaker Ross has done a very good job um, uh, of, of leading that caucus. That'd be a hard thing. I mean, to try to keep 120 or so uh, people, different, uh, egos and uh, agendas uh, all going, uh, that's hard. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he, uh, Dave has done a great job at that. Um, but I think he's, he, he's let them feel like they have their say in the caucus. And he, frankly, he's let enough legislation out, uh, maybe on some of these social issues and other things, hadn't gone totally to the right, but has left enough of it out, uh, I think, that, that satisfies them and, and convinces them that, that uh, his heart's in the right place. Uh, but at the same time, he's been mindful of, of, of what you can do and, and, and what's good policy for the state. So I think he's done a very good job of balancing that. I think uh, on, the, on the other side, in the Senate, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Cagle's done the same thing. Uh, he's, he's, he's done the same thing. He, 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 he listens to the caucus and, and gives them a voice. Uh, in the final analysis, sometimes the decision's gotta be made, Casey's gotta make a decision, or Speaker Ross has gotta make a decision, and they make it. But they, they let the process sort of play out and, and, and give everybody some, some input. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, if you'll do that, uh, again, something I learned in practicing law, if you let them just have their say, let them vent a little bit, have their say, feel like they, they've made their case, they, they can move on. And so I think that's what's happened. What issues do you think there are? We, we've mentioned sort of the polarization uh, of both parties, right. um, national level and in the state level. Yeah. What issues do you, do you think there are in Georgia where, where, where Democrats and Republicans can still work together or, or can hopefully work uh, together in the future? I think, uh, I, th I think there are some, and I think they're gonna have to. Uh, we, we, we do not want to get to a place in this state where we're like D.C., where it's just total gridlock. You just can't do it. It's not good for the state. Uh, and and I, I, to that point, I'll, I'll, I'll give kudos to Governor Deal. I mean, he has, he has worked uh, both sides of the aisle on some big issues, uh, education being one, criminal justice reform right, being right. probably the biggest where they've, they've done initiatives and, and, and he's gotten unanimous votes in the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats. I mean, that shows it can be done. I think the areas that you, you probably can see some consensus on uh, moving forward, hopefully will be some sort of tax reform. Uh, I think you also got room in, in the area of child welfare and care. Um, they had the uh, adoption bill last year that right. got held up. Uh, because of some partisan wrangling, but I think they're gonna move past that and move forward this year. So I think uh, uh, that area, and then uh, you would hope education, you would hope education they can get together. I know uh, Governor Deal's initiative on the takeover of the schools failed when it went to the public. They came back last year and, and did sort of a revised version of that that both sides seemed much more comfortable with. So it starts with the people involved it, 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 you got to have somebody like Governor Deal who's going to reach out both sides and try to bring them together. I think the mistake that a lot of times they've made in D.C. is they, uh, they, the Republicans try to do it all on the, by themselves, uh, or the Democrats did it when they were in control, and the other side gets, gets uh, left out of the process. They get frustrated, and so they knee-jerk, and they vote against it. And uh, with the slim majorities you got now, you're always going to need a few <laughs> from either side if you're gonna get something done, that's what they're finding out right now. We've avoided that in Georgia so far, and uh, certainly it's got more partisan down here, there's no doubt about that. Um, the, the best thing, frankly, we could do at a national level and a state level to try to get away from this 
would be would be to do a new approach on redistricting. The problem you've got right now is redistricting is so partisan, you end up with districts that are either solidly Republican or solidly Democrat. Right. They're not middle of the road. When I ran back in 86, that was a middle of the road district. And, and, and they, you, you had to be middle of the road to win. Now, the way the districts are, between, uh, if you're a Democrat in a Democrat district, you're not worried about a Republican, you're worried about somebody in a primary running at, against you. Same thing on the Republican side. They don't worry about a Democrat, they worry about a Republican. So as a result, you tend to get, you push toward to the extremes, and, and you may have a Republican who's an incumbent who is moderate to conservative, but right. if, they, if they've got somebody who's trying to outflank them on the right, they're gonna have to get more over there to cut them off. And it sort of forces their hand this way, Democrats this way, and you end up with extremes on both sides as opposed to more middle of the road, where, which is conducive to agreement and, and uh, compromise and, and getting things done. They, you, I'm, not saying that, I'm not saying they're gonna be able to change that process, but if they could, that would go a long way towards solving the problems we got nationally and locally. So let's, let's put your, your, your partisan political hat back on. The, the Republican Party has controlled the state for 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, a far cry from how long the Democrats right. had control. Um, what is the greatest threat to the Republican majority in this state? Hmm. Probably just the changing demographics, frankly. I mean, the state is growing, continues to grow, continues to change. I mean, you look at when, when I came in in 86, Gwinnett County was the most Republican county, I think, in the nation, except maybe Santa Barbara. Yeah, California. Orange County, maybe. Yeah, it was, I mean, that was, that was Republican central. You look at Gwinnett County now, it, it, it is a veritable melting pot of, of different uh, nationalities and races. Right. It's totally changed. And that's happening around the state. Uh, you, you see changes everywhere you go. So. Uh, the Republican Party is going to have to recognize that and, and, and come up with ways to reach out to the changing demographics that are going on. Uh, the, the young people now, uh, the millennials, um, you know, they, they don't seem to be as partisan. Sometimes they don't even seem to be as involved. Uh, politics sort of turns them off. You've got to find a way to reach them. The, the, the Republican demographic is getting older. Right. Um, it, they, they've got to reach out and find a way to uh, attract uh, these younger voters and, and, and voters of different uh, races and nationalities. I think they can do that if they hone their message. A lot of the messages the Republicans talk about on taxes, on crime, on family, that kind of thing, appeals to a lot of these folks, but they've not done a real good job of, of of sort of crystallizing it and, and, and addressing it to them, and, and they and they're missing it somehow. How how much of that is, is the either the fault of or influenced by sort of the national political dialogue, which is, you know, by all measures, pretty very partisan, uh, all, you know, very toxic political environment. A lot of that impacts it, and and it goes back to what we were just saying that that that. I think a lot of the Republicans are scared to move in that direction because they're gonna get outflanked in a primary by someone who's a little more rigid, a little more, mm -hmm. and, and they might have a chance to beat them in a primary. And so that it, it makes it difficult for them to make that move. Uh, it, it takes some guts and it takes some leadership to, to do that. Right. And, and uh, um, I think we've had that kind of leadership here in the state, uh, again, with Governor Deal and and, and Governor Purdue uh, uh, and uh, Lieutenant Governor Cagle and Speaker Ralston, we've had that kind of leadership. Uh, we've got to keep it. We, we can't let it get too far over one way or the other. Uh, it's just not good. So tell me about your, your, your current work. As you said, you, you know, mm -hmm. you're in governmental affairs. Right. Um, do you, is it just government lobbying or is there, is there what is it exactly that okay. you do? For, for those who don't know what lobbyists do, how, how do you describe your work? Right. Uh, well, uh, our firm, Georgia Link Public Affairs Group, I, I joined it uh, when I left the Senate in 96, so I've been here about 21 years now. 
Uh, basically, what we do, we are what is called contract lobbyists. We don't represent one particular company or one particular business or, or entity. Uh, we, we are hired by uh, businesses, by associations, uh, by local governments uh, to represent their interests at state capital. It, it, it's somewhat similar when I practice law. You, a client hires you to advocate on their behalf. And so we, we represent a wide variety of interests. There are five principals here in the firm. Um, and so we, we, uh, we represent some Fortune 500 companies like uh, UPS, American Express, uh, Publix Supermarket, T-Mobile, that kind of thing, some, some, some big companies. Sure. We represent some associations, uh, represent uh, the OBGYN Society, which is all the OBs in the state. We represent the Georgia Pest Control Association, which are all the pest control operators in the state. So we do that. We do we do some uh, some other business. We represent the Atlanta Braves, which has been very interesting the last few years with their move to Cobb County. That's been. I'll have to been, talk to you about tickets afterward. We, <laughs> that's <laughs> been fun. Uh, we represent the uh, golf industry in Georgia. Uh, so a little bit of everything. And but what I like about it is, which is sort of what I liked about when I served in the Senate, you're dealing with a lot of different issues. You're not doing the same thing every day. Uh, I get to learn a lot about businesses. We tell the clients when they come in, you educate us on your business. We want to learn all about your business, mm -hmm. and then we'll educate you on the politics and try to see where we can get, get you from point A to point B. But our job is to advocate for them, to be at the Capitol, uh, and to, uh, if there's legislation that, that favorably impacts them, to, to try to advocate and move that through. Sure. If it's legislation that's going to uh, be detrimental to them, we try to uh, explain why it's detrimental, not only to them, but to the state, and uh, either amend it so it's not detrimental or, or try to see that the bill is, is not passed. So we're involved with the process. Um, uh, like I say, I like the process, uh, and, 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 and it keeps us, keeps, us, uh, keeps us very busy. We do a lot of health care work. Uh, we represent a number of hospitals uh, and physician associations as well. So, you know, a little bit of everything. So it sounds like a lot of it has to do with, I don't want to say pro-business because it's not necessarily pro-business, yep. but pro-growth, yep. um, so private-public partnerships. Do you think Georgia's, uh, that's something Georgia's been known for right. going back you know, well into the 60s and 70s. Do you think that's still the case, that that's sort of Absolutely. the consensus? Absolutely. And, and a lot of what we argue for usually is, is around the, the, the the uh, term, you know, this is going to be good for business in Georgia. Uh, but I think Georgia is definitely still that way. Um, we, we are very active with the Georgia Chamber of Commerce. We're active with the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. Uh, most of our clients are businesses. But we, but we do think if you're growing business, that's going to provide jobs. That's going to help provide health care. That's going to do a lot of things for uh, the families here in Georgia. And, and we think the, the policies we're advocating on our, behalf of our clients are, are good for them, but also good for the state as mm -hmm. a whole. So Georgia politics, um, you were involved in the 80s uh, and the 90s, you know, and, and you're still involved from yeah. a different perspective. Where do you think, what do you think it looks like 10, 20 years down the road um, based on where you've been, you know, where do you think it's going? It, 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 it will be different. I, th I, think, I think you're going to see, um, and I've seen this already, uh, you, you're going to see more women involved in it, and, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I know early on um, in, in our caucus when I was in the Senate, we had, we had one woman. That was it. Uh, so Sally knew, Newbell. Sally Newbell. That's exactly. Right. She came in the same year I did. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think you're going to see more women involved. You're going to see more minorities involved. Uh, we, we've already got the largest black caucus in the country, but uh, really? yeah, and uh, and we work very closely with them as as lobbyists. We try to work with the women's caucus, the black caucus, the rural caucus, uh, not just Republican and Democrat. We try to reach across the aisle and do that. We think that's important. Uh, but I, I, it's it's definitely going to be uh, it's definitely going to be different. Uh, um, certainly, when I came in in 1980s, I, I, I'll give you a good example. When I got there in '86. I was 31 years old. Uh, Hugh Gillis, who was in the Senate from Soperton, uh, had been in the Senate longer than I'd been alive. 
<laughs> he, had been yeah. in the, he had been in the yeah. Senate at that point about 36 years, something like that. He ended up serving almost 50 years in the Senate. So that you don't see that longevity as much anymore. It used to be these, these, these folks, mostly men, mm -hmm. got elected mm -hmm. and they were there a long time. Most of them were from south of the nat, nat line. It's, the turnover is much more now than it used to be. Uh, I think right now, what's the, uh, something like more than half of the legislature right now has been there less than four years. Yeah, yeah. It, In it, Athens, we just lost two, two of our... Exactly. Um, how two of the three House members have just... It, it turns know. over much more quickly than it used to. The demands of the job are more, and, 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 and some people kind of get burnt out on it and, and, uh, and, and just can't stay as long as they used to. But, uh, but you, you'll, you'll see that change, I think, uh, as well. What, what do you think about the... We mentioned changing demographics. How do you think that's going to play into sort of the shifting uh, politics or political culture as, as rural Georgia continues to... Um, you know, shrink yeah. uh, population-wise, you know, their economies, things that's, like that's that. That's probably the biggest concern, one of the biggest concerns I think we should have as a state right now. Uh, and, and, and to uh, Speaker Ralston's credit, he's, he's, he's formed a, a committee to look at that. I know the Lieutenant Governor, uh, he has also been very involved in that in, in trying to come up with some policies to help r r rural Georgia because they are losing population. It's not a good thing. Um, there, there are a number of reasons why, uh, mainly lack of opportunity. Right, it, right. The jobs just aren't there. And you see these kids, they, they leave, they may leave town to go to college or whatever, and there's nothing to come back to. And that's unfortunate. And, and so you're seeing uh, Casey Cagle and David Ralston and the, the governor and others uh, trying to work on that uh, to, tr to try to make more opportunities. You know, it all, it's all interconnected. Right. Health, healthcare, a lot, lot of these communities, the hospitals have closed. So if there's no hospital there, a business is reluctant to locate a business there right. or expand its business there. You've got to deal with the health care issue. You've got to deal with the transportation issue. You've got to deal with, I know right now the hot thing is broadband. You've, oh, got, yeah. you've yep. got some areas that don't have good access to broadband. That is a problem. So you, you mentioned transportation. Uh, well, we're, we're going to take okay. a break. So we were talking about rural Georgia um, and the different pieces uh, of policy that, that have tried, we've attempted to implement, we are trying to implement. Um, you were talking about broadband internet right. access. Right. And, and you know, it, th that right now seems to be the hot button issue coming into the 2018 session. And a lot of people have equated it to, I, I know our Congressman Drew Ferguson the other day was quoting a paper saying this is Broadband is sort of like the Rural Electrification Act back during Roosevelt's time, you know, back when people didn't have electricity <laughs> run all the way to their house. Now you've got to have broadband so that people have access to the internet and, and can communicate. Um, you know, it, it, it's a, there's not one silver bullet for the problem of rural right. Georgia. The thought was, frankly, back when I was legislature, let's build these developmental highways. That'll solve the problem. We spent a lot of money on that and uh, build some very nice roads. Very nice. It has not solved the problem. Now, it's made transportation easier and it's helped in a lot of ways. For instance, I think if you look at it, some of those developmental highways we built uh, had been a major factor in the growth of the Port of Savannah because it's made it easier to transport goods Fair across point. South yep. Georgia and, and, and the like. And we're having to add to that because the ports have grown so much. But it's played a part there. But in terms of helping these little communities and towns grow and prosper, that's one piece, but you've got to have, as I mentioned, you've got to have health care. Uh, we've, got, we've got to deal with that problem, and we do, we do a lot of work in health care uh, from the lobbying side, as I said, mm -hmm. and we're trying to work on ways to do that in terms of to incentivize doctors to go to rural communities. I'll give you an interesting statistic. We've got 159 counties in Georgia. Over half of them currently do not have an OBGYN in them, over half. And that problem is getting worse, not better. And is that, that, that predominantly South and Middle Georgia. Yep, yep, and and, and over in the uh, the eastern part of the state, mm -hmm. uh, between Savannah and Augusta. Oh that, yeah, some of yeah. that part. Mm -hmm. Now Savannah's in good shape. Augusta's in great shape, but some of that path between there uh, is not served. And of course, when you don't have access uh, to to good medical care, you get bad outcomes with with birth, uh, childbirth. Uh, the maternal mortality rate. Uh, maternal mortality rate in Georgia is the worst in the nation. 
Uh, we're trying to address that. But, you know, if you're a business, you're seeing these things, right. you're not prone to locate there. So it, it takes health care, it takes transportation, it takes communication uh, like broadband. You've got to come together with all that. Some communities are doing better jobs than others. I'll give you an example. Thomasville, way down in South mm -hmm. Georgia, yeah. has done, from all indications, I've got done a pretty good job of trying to address a lot of that. Health care, uh, broadband, a lot of, they, they've done good work and uh, so I think you can look at them and some other communities around uh, LaGrange is a good example um, as you get out of Atlanta uh, they've done good jobs and, and as a result they they've uh, they've grown and uh, but but some of them have not um, how is it possible or, or, or what are the approaches or practices that, that local communities or counties I suppose what tools are at their disposal for for doing because these sound like big you know you mentioned rural electrification which was a very top down right right you know, federal program uh, are the you know is this a blend of federal grants developmental block grants I think or what you, things I think like what that? you're going to see is is a combination of I think the, the the feds are starting to realize what a problem this is mm -hmm. so you'll see some some money coming from the feds if, if they can get their act together with the federal government but I think there's there's at least an interest in trying to do that number one. Uh, Number two, you're going to see the state step in with some incentives, uh, particularly in the broadband area, to try to incentivize mm -hmm. development and build out of broadband and transportation. You're going to see the state do that. But again, the locals have to, you know, they, they can, they're going to have to step up too in, in a lot of ways in terms of perhaps you know, using SPLOS money to, to build out certain things, right. uh, be it that or, uh, uh, you know, it, it gets back to leadership and trying to be, trying to be creative and innovative. Uh, but but you've got to have that uh, at the local level, and some some communities have, frankly, have had it better than others in that, in that regard. Sure. Is there anything else we haven't touched on? I have, I've already Goodness. probably taken up too much of your time. No, not today. at all. I, I will say you've done your home, you did your homework very well. I've been very impressed with that. I will, I will say that. Well, I yeah. pr I appreciate yeah, that. I've, I've enjoyed it, and uh, it's brought back a lot of a lot of good memories. Well, thank you very much, um, Skin Edge. Um, thank you for participating in the, the two-party Georgia oral history program. We really do appreciate it. Thank you.